thank you very much for being here today with us. Um, we might have one or two additional classes that are jumping on while they deal with some technical difficulties. Of course. As you can see, the classroom has changed a little bit, but we wanted you to see some of our live classrooms. Uh, this I love it. The students are dealing with having barriers and masks, but um, everybody, if you want to wave and say hi to Mr. Shinnick. Hey, guys. All That's right. Amazing. It's a whole, whole new <laughs> so, world, isn't it? It certainly is, but I have to say our kids have been incredible, um, and we are very thankful to you and for the PTA for making this happen for us today. So I uh, just want to start and give a brief inter uh, introduction for you, if that's okay. Of course, and you know, I was also thinking, I know I had said otherwise, but if you want to hit me, are you prepared or do you want to hit me with the questions? I thought maybe that would be more entertaining than me just talking all that time. I can, I can certainly throw some questions your way. We could all do right. that. So, right. uh, so for those of you um, who I know have been waiting for uh, Mr. Shinnick to speak with us, and uh, I know a lot of students have gotten very excited. Today we gave away some of uh, Mr. Shinnick's books, so thank you oh, again great. to PTA, and we have some of the comics and some winners that have been announced over the last week. Excellent. Uh, Kevin Shinnick is an Emmy Award winning writer. Uh, he's a number one best selling author and a celebrated comic book creator, as well as an actor, director, and multiple Annie Award winning producer. Best well, known, yeah, you have a lot on your resume. Too much, too much. You don't have to read it all. <laughs> uh, I, do, I do want the students to know, I think one of the most uh, exciting things for some of the kids to learn was that you did grow up in Merrick. You uh, went to Brookside when it was a middle school and you graduated from Calhoun High School. I did, I did. And uh, I'm, I'm a better person because of it all. <laughs> So uh, we, we want to give you a chance maybe to just talk about yourself a little bit, introduce yourself to the kids, and then I will hit you with some questions when you're ready. Sounds good. Well, again, thank you so much for having me. I'm very I'm always excited to come back to Merrick and connect with people when I can because it always it plays such an important part in my life and still resonates not only in, in me, but also in a lot of my work. Um, as you said, or as I'll say, I'm Kevin. Um, I am, you know, I, I I'm a writer. You, there are so many things that you mentioned that I do, but I think what I've, what's what's so special about it and why I wanted to be here is because I've seemed to make a career out of all the things that I truly enjoyed when I was your age sitting in those seats. Maybe not those seats since I was in Brookside, but those same type of seats at that same type of age. And a lot of people have always ask me like, you know, how long do things go back or how do you start? And to me, a lot of it just kind of centers on where we all start in life and what our surroundings are, who our friends are, and our schools and our teachers. And, you know, you don't realize it, maybe some of you do, but that's where the seeds are planted. And, you know, you get to a point where you've seen all those seeds grow and come to fruition. So, yes, I... I've been fortunate enough for those who like Star Wars to have worked with George Lucas. I've been fortunate enough for those who like Spider-Man and superheroes to have worked with Stan Lee. I, I wrote a Scooby-Doo and Kiss movie, which was beyond exciting for me because I, at the age you guys are, I was obsessed with Kiss. Um, and there, I've just been very fortunate to be able to choose what projects I work on and also be given the opportunity to do such wonderful things. I, I work with Mike Tyson on a show called the Mike Tyson Mysteries. And I think you guys are a little too young to be watching it. You may, but I'm not sure. A show called Robot Chicken, which uh, gave me my start and uh, is a lot of fun with pop culture things. But like I said, the, the key and the core to all of this is the fact that I've tried to stay connected to what I enjoyed and what inspired me at an early age. And as a result, I'm now surrounded by all the things. My, my room looks a lot like it did when I was your age, much to the chagrin of my family. But, um, but you know, I, I am a writer and an actor and a producer and a director and all that stuff. But no matter what field you're interested in, I feel a lot of what I talk about relates to almost anything. Because we live in a world now where I truly believe that if you have an interest there's a career for you. You know, I was told, my mom was like, you watch too much television. And then I hosted my own television show. You know, you read too many comics. And now I've written my own comics. You know, I know people who, parents who are like, oh, my kids won't get off the video games. That's all fine, but utilize that skill. There are jobs where people, you know, 
create video games. One of my favorite stories, and then we'll get into the questions, is there was a guy, um, his name is Mark Sansweet. He loves Star Wars. And he collected so many Star Wars things that people thought he was crazy he had so many Star Wars things. He had to buy like storage units of Star Wars things. And then he became so well known that Lucasfilm called him and said, why don't you work for us? You catalog so much Star Wars stuff. We've got the ultimate Star Wars stuff. Why don't you be the one in charge of all the archives? So my feeling is if you have a passion, follow it and stick to it as long as it remains something that's close to your heart because, you know, in this day and age, you can make a career almost doing anything. Thank you very much. And I think that's a fantastic message for our middle school students as they start figuring out what they really like and what they're really into. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start with an easy one. What was the favorite project that you worked on so far? Oh my God, it's so tough to say. I mean, you know, I turned what was a, a magazine called Mad Magazine into an animated sketch comedy show for Cartoon Network. And because I had grown up loving that magazine, that was a, a career choice that I spent many years just enjoying everything related to that show. But there have been so many like one-on-one -on -one moments, like, again, a Star Wars fanatic I am. To get to work with George Lucas, I had to pinch myself. I mean, I literally sat in a room next to him pitching story and I was up at Skywalker Ranch for about a month. And I'm so glad it was about a month because for the first week and a half, whenever he spoke, all I heard was mop, 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 because my mind just kept saying, you made Star Wars, you made Star Wars. And it took me about two weeks for him to become human. And then I realized, oh, he's, he's just like us. He's just a guy trying to make entertainment and trying to make art. And then finally, I was able to see him as a, as a colleague and be able to collaborate with him. But uh, that, those are two right there. I don't think many people get that honor to say they've worked with George Lucas, so that's pretty <laughs> incredible. Uh, so what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna pull from some of the student questions and Great. then maybe we can take some live questions from some of the students as we talk a little bit more. Maybe that'll uh, you know, spark some more of their totally. questions. Uh, so we're gonna start with a question from Mark Oladipo and he said, what was your high school, what was Calhoun High School like when you went there and how is it, you know, how do you think it might be different from it is now? And when did you decide what you wanted to do? Well, it's a good question. As I said, I mean, Calhoun's still there, but I, so long ago I went to junior high that I went to Brookside, which I have fond memories of, but now, what is it now, an administrative building? I'm not even sure what it is anymore. Um, it's, and it's a prep academy where some of our students continue on to. Oh, okay. And an okay. electrical engineering facility as well. Wow. Oh, we left it in good hands then. Um, you know, I got to think that in many ways, high school is similar in the sense that for me, high school was about my friends and my relationships. And I can't imagine no matter what technologies exist now that didn't exist then or styles or whatever, that you're going through a very similar experience that we all do, which is finding out who your friends are, finding the groups that you're interested in, finding the people who are there to challenge you. And, you know, as I said before, that's where a lot of these seeds are sown. Um, even as a writer, you realize there's always, in, in any good book or any good movie, there's always something called a callback. And that's something that shows up at the end of your, of your, of your tale that you talked about in the beginning. And I see a lot of my life having callbacks to things that were planted back when I was in junior high or high school. Friends I'm still in touch with. Um, you know, when I had Force Collector came out last year, uh, I don't know if we talked about this, but um, I put Merrick in my book, in a sense. Um, to me, this the character of Carr in that book, it was a, a coming of age story. And I thought, well, what do I have in relation to Carr? Where was I when I was asking the question that he's asking? And I realized it was during this age when I was in Merrick. And so being, Merrick was a little too on the nose. I thought, man, they're not gonna let me get away with that. But when it came time to create the name of the planet that my character was from, I figured I wanted to make Carr, which is his, his name, a Marokian. So I called the planet Marokia. So now we had a big celebration last December where they gave, they, they have a, they proclaimed, I think it was the December 19th Force Collector Day where Merrick was recognized as being permanently in the Star Wars canon. Um, 
so that got off topic a little bit, but again, it's, that's how things are, are similar, but in many ways, the technology is what changes. You know, I, I can't even fathom going to school with all the social media that you guys have. And, you know, my heart goes out to you sometimes when I think socially of all the, you know, internet criticism and things like that can, can be very tough. On the flip side, I'm also envious of all the uh, advantages you guys have. Putting things on YouTube, putting, you know, you can record something on your phone, you could do whatever. So when you talk superficially about technology and things you have available to you, those are the things that changes. But really, to me, it was about relationships. And I think those always stay the same no matter when you're going to junior high or high school. Well, thank you. And thank you for making sure Maroki is now part of the Star Wars of uh, family. Of so course. December 19th, Merrick Avenue students, we have to celebrate. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so Thomas Rooney asked, how did you start writing comic books and what age were you when you developed this interest? Which I think you've kind of talked about middle school and high school being. Yeah, high. I always loved comic books. That was my go-to, you know, I, uh, Spider, I guess, Spider-Man was my number one favorite character, but then after that, it was a lot of DC comics, Batman, Flash, Superman. Um, and then, you know, as I said before, I just have been lucky to stay in the realm of which I like. And when you do that and you prove yourself, people start to come to you. I mentioned the show Robot Chicken that I'm on, and I did a number of Batman sketches because that was something that interested me. And then I'd go to Comic-Con to do panels and stuff. And some of the editors at DC Comics had seen those sketches and they were like, oh, you must really love Batman. I was like, yeah. And they were like, well, you should come write a comic for us. And I was like, well, don't joke. Yeah, I was like, don't throw that out there. And they was like, no, we mean it. And then similarly, a few years later, the same thing happened with Marvel when I was doing Mad. One of the uh, editors and VPs came up and said, you know, my family's a big fan of Mad. And I was like, I'm a big fan of St uh, Spider-Man. He's like, well, why don't you write some comics for us? And it's so funny because they say it so easily, like it's a thing, but you know, you don't change. I'm still the 10 year old Emmy who was like, yes. So that's how I broke into comics. Okay. So you're making it sound very easy. Oh, well, it's not easy, <laughs> but you know, I I'll get into more of that later, but it's so funny because they, they always say, you know, in this business it's who you know, but what they discount is how long it takes to know all those people. You know, a lot of this, I'm talking to you now, but a lot of my writing career didn't start until I was 30, I think. And, and I was primarily just an actor before that. So I kind of came to writing late in life. Um, and a lot of struggles leading up to that, you know? So these are the, the icing on the cake that's fun to talk about, but there are, there are plenty of journeys in there. I'm sure. Um, so Justin Mitkish asked, what was your inspiration for Force Collector and how did you deal with incorporating Star Wars canon? And thank you for speaking at our school. Oh, well, of course, I'm happy you're having me. You know, I am a history buff. Um, I used to host this television show called Where in Time is Carmen San Diego that was all about history. And so that's always a natural go-to for me. But I got this idea when Star Wars is everywhere. And I was asked to write a novel and I thought, well, how do you do something? How do you keep Star Wars fresh in, in a world where it is everywhere you look? And I thought in some ways, I thought we know more about Star Wars than the people who live in that galaxy far, far away. Like I treated the, those battles in Star Wars, the, the Clone Wars and all those things like our history. I thought, how much do we know about World War I, World War II, the Civil War? I mean, granted, we know who the players were, we know who won, but then every now and then you hear a story like Dunkirk or Schindler's List or Glory, and you realize there's so many facets of these battles that we've never heard of. And I thought it must be very similar to kids in that Star Wars universe. They know there was a war, but they don't know much about it. And so, I wanted to, by using the force, basically the story of my uh, character is, there's a kid named Carr and he gets these really bad headaches uh, when he, after he turns 13 and he doesn't know why. And his grandmother thinks that he may have the force, he just doesn't know how to use it yet. Because when he touches objects, he gets to see their past. And so she basically says to him, you know, I think you could have the power of a Jedi. And he knows none of this. He doesn't know who the Jedi are. He doesn't know anything about the, what we know of Star Wars. So she's like, well, what am I supposed to do? And he, she says, go out 
and treat life as your master. Go out and find history, touch things, let them show you their past, and maybe that will guide you to becoming a Jedi. So my inspiration was really my own enjoyment of history. And I thought if I can get people interested in Star Wars history, maybe they can also be interested in their own history. Well, thank you. And you're appealing to some history buffs. I know there's a lot, there's some history classes on right now. I'm a right. former history teacher, Ms. Mahoney and Mr. Kiko are on here. Excellent. So, yeah, you're definitely appealing to a lot here. <laughs> Good. Um, so Alyssa Walden asked, in middle school, was there anything or anyone that inspired you to do what you do now? You know, the answer is absolutely yes. And you take it from different realms. Um, and I'm not just saying this because I'm speaking to the middle school, but my English teachers have always been a huge, have had a huge impact on me. Um, my English teacher was named Bob Dietrich in middle school. Um, my English teachers in high school were Carol Bendel and Sal Salerno. Some of them are still there. Um, and I'm still in touch with them because they kind of introduced me to things that I didn't know existed, I guess. But you also take it from things you enjoy. You know, the, uh, Neil Simon growing up was a huge influence on me. Woody Allen, the Marx Brothers, you know, there were all these things that I knew I wanted to entertain people. I thought it was gonna be primarily as an actor. And then as life changes and things shape and you find different interests, it realized that it doesn't have to be one thing. It could be a lot of things that shape who you are and what you do. And so I think it was those people who helped guide me um, to where I was. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't that, an av much of an avid reader in middle school and high school. I remember in, I think it was seventh grade or eighth grade, reading a book called The White Mountains, which I loved and kind of was the first book that I thought, oh, hey, wait a minute, I like this. this. This is not just, I'm not being told to read something and I have to read it and I got a report on it. I found it really interesting. And then that's when you realize, oh, there are so many books out there, you could find ones that interest you. So we're going to do one more of these questions. Then we have some students who I think want to ask some live questions, if that's okay with you. Yeah. So um, one of the final ones I'm going to ask is, how has being part of the Merrick uh, community helped lead you to your career path? And if we were to look you up in a past yearbook, uh, Justin Donaldson wants to know, what clubs or sports would they find you participating in? Excellent. All right. Well, I always feel, like I said, especially with Force Collector, that Merrick has always played an important part in my life. And I think... You know, you rely on your town or where you come from to be the kind of place that you want to be from. Um, and then as you get older, it kind of is the tail eating its, its own, uh, the snake eating its own tail because it makes you want to be the kind of person that contributes to the town that makes you want to be from that town. So I was always very involved in Merrick. Um, you know, again, keeping with the pop culture and stuff, my, my first job was at the McDonald's on, uh, on Merrick Road that's still there. But then after that, I was, I worked for many years at, at the Merrick Movie Theater, which is now gone, they moved it. But this was in the Holiday Park Shopping Center, which I think is now a giant supermarket. But I was always doing stuff with the community. I was always volunteering, um, you know, when I was honored in, on, in December from the county executive, I told her I spent a good part of my college years working with the then current county executive, Tom Galata, and doing things for the town. Um, I have to blame my mother for this, but going back to the bicentennial in 1976, I think I was Merrick Life's mascot. And every week I was in some way, shape or form dressed up as George Washington on the cover of that paper. So, um, and if you looked back uh, at my yearbook, I was class president, I have to say, for I think every year from ninth through senior year, I was lucky enough to get reelected by my friends. Um, so I was always an intricate part of the school community because I was class president. I joined track um, as a sport because my dad begged me to do something athletic. Uh, but I did, but I had a great time on track. Uh, a funny thing is he begged me to join a sport in I think ninth grade, or maybe it was, no, it was like seventh grade. So I joined track and I just hated it. I hated everything about it. And then things change. And like, I think one of the reasons I didn't like anything about it was I was new, I didn't know anybody, I didn't give it a chance. And then three years later I joined again and I was MVP. 
I was captain, all my friends joined, we, had, we were undefeated. It, it was just so much fun. So there's, a, there's something to the opportunity waiting for you at the right time in the right place. You sound very well-rounded and taking a little participation in everything and trying a little bit of everything, which is... And I should say, I was a huge theater guy, too. I mean, South Salina also ran the drama department, and that was my, you know, my go-to, English and drama. Um, but yes, I did try and do a little bit, so I did the track, and I was class president, and anywhere I could help, what I did. And you were the mascot, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, we do have a live question from Ms. Mahoney's class. So if that student can come up and just say your name and feel free to ask Kevin Shinnick a question. Wait, you may be muted. Yeah, we can't hear you. Let's see. See, and this is the technical difficulties we now uh, jump This has been going swimmingly. I've had meetings that don't go as well as this. <laughs> oh, we can hear you, Miss Pony. Can you hear us? Oh, yay. Okay, go. <laughs> go ahead, Tina. Okay, so, so my question was, were you ever, like, put down for what you wanted to do? Or, like, did you have ever have a moment that you weren't even going to be able to do it? Absolutely. Um, great question, by the way. What was your name? Mia. Nice to meet you. Um, you know, it's also funny because comic books and things like Star Wars are, are so accepted nowadays and they're everywhere and everybody's into them. That's a slightly annoying because when I was a kid, you, you kind of not look down upon, but like, oh, you're reading comics. You know, they're not serious. They make fun of you. They're for kids. And now the culture has just completely changed. So I gratefully, because I've, like I said, made a career out of it. But between that and also, uh, I told you I wanted to be an actor, and I am an actor, but I solely was focusing on acting, and that's an incredibly difficult path. And you are criticized in one shape or form, whether it be by not getting a role or by cr being critiqued or getting reviewed. Um, and, you know, as I said, this is a bumpy path, right? But you've got to love what you do. And I tell people this all the time, again, forget about writing or acting, whatever it is you, whatever it is you want to do, you should stick it out and do it, but stick it out as long as it makes you happy. I also know people who are trying to pursue being writers or actors who are not successful and keeping at it and enjoying every step of the way. And I think that's fantastic. I also have friends who are miserable doing it. And I'm like, this, who are you trying to prove this to? Do it as long as it makes you happy, because that's the key to everything, is to find something that makes you happy. Thank you. And so now we have uh, another live question from Mr. DeLugazima's class from Jack Izzo. So Jack, if you can come on up. Did you work on the Bop It episode of Robot Chicken? The what episode? The Bop It one. I don't know if I did. How recent is that? that's probably pretty recent, I guess, huh? It's not one of the more it's not one of the more recent ones, but it's pretty recent. I don't recall the bop it, I'm sorry to say. We do so many sketches and I've written so many sketches, but I don't recall doing the bop it one. I'm uh, sorry to say. <laughs> Hope that doesn't disappoint you. Uh, so just want to ask a few more questions from here and we'll see if we can get a couple more live questions. Uh, Sophia Kayantis asked, what was the most struggling thing you had to do to get where you are now? You know, it's not so much a day or an event. It's finding the faith and finding the inspiration to know that you're on the right path. Um, and anybody deals with this every day of their lives. It doesn't really go away necessarily. <laughs> but um, Again, I'm gonna focus on the acting because I went to school for acting and then you get out in the real world and it's kind of like, oh, oh, that's what they meant by maybe choose something more secure. But I really was interested in, in pursuing that and I did. And, you know, that meant, you know, getting, a, getting an apartment in Manhattan with four friends because we, you know, couldn't afford to live there on our own. That meant getting up early and going to auditions and, 
trying to be in the realm of what I want to be because I do believe that people succeed in groups. And if you like, if you watch, if you go back and look at old photos of like Leo DiCaprio or um, Tobey Maguire, you'll, you'll see like Tobey Maguire in the background or Sam Rockwell in the background before they were anybody. And that's because they were all a close group of people who were trying to work together. And again, I feel that once you succeed, others will succeed around you because you're learning from each other, you're sharing with each other, and you're experiencing things uh, with each other, and it kind of helps go that way. So th there have been lots of struggles, but that's, that's kind of my, my hint, is to do it as a group if you can. Okay, so we have a couple more live questions coming in. So uh, we're gonna start with um, a question from Mr. Kiko's class. So we have someone coming up from Mr. Kiko's class. And if you can, just tell um, Mr. Shinnick your name and what your question is. Uh, hello, Mr. Shinnick. I hope you're having a good day. Um, what was the what was your favorite comic that you've ever written? You know, of course, for different reasons. Like the first time I got to do a comic, I was out of my mind excited. That was about Batman one. So that was excited because I was able to do a comic. But I, I have to say, there are Flash included. Flash, though, that's coming out now that I think you guys uh, have, are aware of. I'm very proud of. But I think I also like, there was some question here. Someone said they were a big fan of Carnage. I did a, a run of Superior Carnage. And I, I really felt that was a great, uh, a great take. And also, I had a short run on something called um, Superior Spider-Man Team-Up. And for those of you know who are fans of Spider-Man, it was the first time that Doc Ock and the Green Goblin ever paired up together. And I really, I really felt I, I, I hooked into their characters well and showed you a side, a side we hadn't seen in a while. So those are the comics I'm particularly proud of. So we do also have a question from one of our virtual learners who's at Great. home. Um, and they said, what was your favorite comic you, oh, we did. What was the favorite comic you ever wrote? Okay, it was kind of in there already. Um, and the actual, the gentleman who just asked that question is Mr. Odell, who also won one of your comics this week. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> uh, Ms. Mahoney, I think we have another live question for Ms. Mahoney's class. This was another comic winner. And actually, um, I believe that Jude, you won a book today as well, right? Yes. All right, Jude, come ask your question. Oh, so, there you go. What um, tips would you give to somebody who wants to become an author like me? Dude, that's a great question. I always say two things. One is, if you want to be a writer, then you need to write. You, don't, you can't wait for someone to say to you, here's a job, go write. You need to, if you like comic books, write a comic book. If you like books, novels, write a novel. Don't let people question you or say, you know, oh, just get them out. Because what's gonna happen is, at some point, someone's gonna know that you write. And they're gonna say, Jude, I wanna hire you, but what do you have? And a lot of people who wanna be writers are waiting for someone to say to them, I'm gonna give you a job, but they don't have any samples. They don't have anything, they don't have any experience. So I would say, write is my first bit of advice. My second bit of advice is, expand your horizons. Read a lot watch movies a lot, watch people a lot. Because the writers who are the most interesting are the ones who know more than just writing. Whenever I'm trying to look into a, like even, even a force collector, I thought, what am I doing at the moment that I can bring into this? And I would, had just done that 23andMe and found out about my family heritage. And I thought that totally plays into where I'm going with this. So I like to bring out outside things that have almost nothing to do with what I set my focus on to kind of enhance the characters that I'm doing. So those are my two advices. Keep writing and explore and make sure your horizons are vast. And good luck to you, Jude. <laughs> All right, so I believe we have another question for Mr. Hagen's class. If that student can come up and just say your name and you can ask your question. Um, my name is Olivia. So who is the most inspiring person in your life? Oh, Who is the most inspiring person in your life? Um, 
You know, I will say it changes, Olivia, but, um, you know, right now I have a 10 year old daughter and she inspires me every day. You know, it's not just, a, it's not just saying that it's, I see how she approaches things and I learn more from her probably than she does from me at this point. But I also, you know, George Lucas was a huge inspiration on me, as was Steven Spielberg. You know, growing up, I always say, I was talking about this the other day to somebody, how it's interesting because when I was your age, you knew there were certain directors and writers that you can rely on and you went to a movie because they did it. Nowadays, it seems the franchises kind of lead the direction, meaning you could like Harry Potter, but Harry Potter has had like eight different directors. So there's not one person. There, there, there are fewer directors who have signature styles and signature writing techniques that, you know, you can say, oh, I'm going to it because of this. But in my day, it was definitely George Lucas and Steven Spielberg in terms of movies that really inspired me. In terms of playwrights, like I said, Neil Simon, Woody Allen, and comic book wise, it was just characters that I really enjoyed. So I hope that answers your question. I know it's not, it's not a simple answer of like so-and-so, but because like I said, the other thing is teachers. Teachers always inspire me because they, they kind of show me things that I sh maybe should have seen, but didn't know were there or didn't know to look for them. So I hope that helps you a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we, we are definitely seeing that. There's something, um, I know the on tour company, which you were you know, kind of part of here, um, that's something that the students were just introduced to our eighth grade students a few days ago. So we have a lot of students who are Amazing. now interested in that and um, hopefully we'll be pursuing careers going that way. But yeah. um, we do have another question from Ms. Mahoney's class. If students can come on up. Um, have you ever wanted to give up during your career in writing? Great question. Great question. I've never wanted to, I've never wanted to give up. I've wanted to strangle the people who gave me so many notes that I thought they don't get me. But I've never, but I, I will leave this earth not having done everything I want to do because there's so much that I want to write, so much I want to do, so much I want to experience. So I guess I've never said like, oh, forget it, I give it up. I've taken breaks. And you know, when we talked in the beginning, you rattled off a lot of the stuff that I do. That's one of the reasons I also do a lot of different things because sometimes it takes the pressure off of one. So if I've got a script and I'm freaking out because it's a deadline, they gave me a lot of notes, Sometimes I'll take my mind off of that and I'll focus on a project I'm acting in or a project I'm directing. Um, and so it helps to have some things to take the focus off of and, and kind of use your peripheral vision to, to see, the, see your way clear. So like I said, everybody needs breaks. Everybody has to step away from a little bit, but I know deep in my heart, I would I'd never give up on it all. All right, so we do have a couple more questions that students submitted. So Ryan Marash asked, what do you enjoy more, writing or acting? That's an excellent question that, that I wish I knew the answer to. Um, you know, the thing, I started primarily as an actor and what got me more interested in writing, I, I was always interested in writing, but obviously it was, I saw a certain path. I was gonna be solely an actor. But then as you go and things change and you realize how little power sometimes you have over the material you can choose or the things that you're saying, that I thought I really wanna be able to say what's on my mind and create characters that I like that I will also play. So they kind of work hand in hand. And this is gonna get probably heavy and more meta, but I learned more my, my writing career actually helped my acting career. And I always say like, I probably would have had a better acting career if I didn't want it so much. And yet when writing came along, I loved it, but it wasn't so, I wasn't so desperate to be a part of it. And as a result of that, my career soared. And I was treated differently and I have what's called agents and managers. And it really made me open my eyes to say like, how come as a writer, my agents are at my beck and call and I can tell them what I want. But as an actor, I was more like, Ooh, can you get me an audition? Can I do something, please? 
And I thought, why am I beholden to them in one aspect and then feel in charge in the other one? So I kind of shifted that dynamic and it, it really, it helped and it changed. And I, I booked, I've acted more in the last 15 years than I did my entire career because that's when I think the focus shifted to the writing. Interesting concept. That when you're not as eager for that, it just kind of comes to you. Um, so we have a question from Mr. Higgins, one of our English teachers here. He said, what advice would you have for middle school kids who are interested in your line of work? Well, again, um, we touched upon a little bit of it. I would say find your community, you know, find people who like doing what you're doing. Come up with a reading group, come up with a writing group. You know, I still have writing groups, you know, we still take times to share, you know, we have like unofficial writing groups. I've got a, a core group of friends that I know I can send my material to and get their feedback. And that's a tricky thing too, you know, and that's why I say find your group because some people don't know how to give feedback. Some people maybe are jealous. Some people don't understand it. Some people, whatever. So it's important to find your group um, and, and bounce ideas off each other, use each other, support each other. Um, and like I said before, just keep writing because there, you may have heard this before, but there's a, a theory that goes, no matter what business you're in, you need to do about 10,000 hours of it before you get to be really good. And I do believe in that. Um, so at the age you're at, start, start writing. And you know what? It's, it, maybe it'll be great the first time you do it. Maybe it won't be. It doesn't matter because the more you do, the better you'll get, the more resilient you'll get, and the more adept you'll get at working your craft. All right, so we have a couple more from online and then we'll uh, go to some more live questions. Uh, <laughs> we do have a student who asked, Harnick wanted to know, what was your least favorite project to work on? <laughs> um, I don't know you want to say that. We are recording. You know what? I don't know. It's, it's tough to say. I, like I said, I've been very fortunate to be able to work at places that I, that I like. So I don't know if I have, it may be a cop out, but I don't have something that I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. Why am I on this? I mean, yeah, going back to McDonald's, yeah, there were jobs that I was like, why am I still doing this? But, um, but in terms of my writing career and stuff, you, you know what a key thing too is about all these projects? A lot of times I've told you, you know, I try and make my own, but a lot of times you're told, we'd like you to write this. Lucasfilm came to me and said, we'd like you to write a novel. We'd like you, Marvel comes to me and says, we'd like you to do this character with Spider-Man, DC, so we'd like you to do this with Flash. What I try and do though, is find what interests me about that character or what I like about that character. Why, why, what do I have to say about it? Um, I love The Flash. When they came to me, they literally said, the, the writer who was on before me had done it for four years and Flash has been around for 60 years. And they basically said, look, everything that's we've ever, everything that's ever could be done with Flash has been done. Do you want to take a stab at it? And I was like, well, way to, way to set the bar. <laughs> but I said, yes, I do. And then I thought, well, again, going back to you guys, it's like, what did I love about The Flash when I started reading him? And this particular character, Barry Allen, had his Flash ring. And I was obsessed with that ring as a kid. And I thought, let's do a story about the ring. And what can I bring to this that hasn't been done before and that would excite me? One of the things I always do, whether it's acting or, or writing or not, I guess you can't say as much as acting, but it's like the writing and stuff, I always approach it as an audience member. What do I want to see? What do I, what do I hope author Kevin Shinnick is going to give me as the audience of Kevin Shinnick? So the, the answer is find something in every project that interests you and then none of them will be downers. Thank you. And so Logan, who's one of our virtual learners at home, wants to know, are you working on a comic right now? And I guess if not a comic, what are you working on right now? Uh, I'm working on a lot of stuff. Uh, I am working on a comic. I'm working on a Spider-Man comic called Web. That's supposed to, it was supposed to come out already, but I think COVID has kind of delayed some things. So that should be coming out in, I guess, early to middle part of 2021. 
Um, unfortunately, you can't really talk about a lot of the stuff that I have in t television development because they don't want you to. But um, you can rest assured it's going to involve superheroes and Star Wars and, and all the things I've been talking about. Okay. Um, we do have a couple more live questions coming in. Um, but before we go there, I think obviously as a school building, and um, as you can see, our classrooms have changed a little bit this year. Uh, but our kids are resilient and they are here and it is December. We are excited to still be back in school and be back in school together. So I guess my question for you is how has COVID altered what you've been working on? We know we're talking to you today from California, which is pretty great. We would have never been able to do this in six years. We are all experts in Zoom, but how has COVID kind of changed things for you in the last couple months? You know, as a writer, it hasn't changed things much because I can work from wherever. Um, it kind of, we, we're trying to put a positive spin on this as best we can, as we all do. Um, you know, it's probably, as you guys know, because you're going to school, my daughter's 10 and she's schooling from home. They don't have where they can go to school here. So she's Zooming a lot and she's kind of sick of the computer. So we've tried to do excursions. We've tried to, um, Back earlier when it was a little safer, we went to Turkey of all places because they seem to have handled it better than we had. And we were staying on this island where there were no cases of COVID. So we spent a month there. Um, and again, you know, this all fuels into, I was working when I was there and it, it, it fuels into the idea of expand your horizons. What's something fresh and new that you didn't know about that you can bring into uh, whatever you're working on. Now, I guarantee we're, all our experiences have changed this last year. It's going to be a lot of stories involving people isolated, people stuck places they don't want to go, you know. But again, good or bad, those experiences can help you. They, they shape who you are. Um, so, yes, I'm desperate for this to be over as well, just because I miss the way things had been, and maybe there'll be a new new normal. But um, we're also grateful that, look, my grandmother lived and I think came down with the Spanish flu in 1918 and, and they went around with masks and things. Um, so we're so lucky, as you said, that I can be during this time and still talk to a school or go to school or talk to friends. I think back to her and, you know, what, what could you do back then other than do what they say, wear your mask and never leave your house. <laughs> so... We're making the best of it. All right, thank you. So we have another live question from Ms. Mahoney's class. I think Ms. Mahoney's class, do we still, we're good? Thanks, Mr. Catapano. Yeah, unmute. How is, like, how has your acting career um, has it had anything to do with your writing career? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, aside from what I said about being able to take the pressure off, um, you know, it, it, it informs it. Um, just like being a director now helped my acting career as well because I was able to see things from the other side of the table. You know, when you audition for things, you go in and you're like, Oh, I hope they like me. And if they don't get it, you're like, oh, what did I do wrong is your first line of thought. But sitting on the other side made me realize no one's doing anything wrong. It's just the odds. Are you as tall as I need you to be? Are you blonder than I need you to be? Are you, there are so many factors that go into things that it kind of took the pressure off of the acting to be like, oh, you know what? It's, it, I, I, they do want you to be the person when you walk in the room. They're not against you. They want this to be an easy choice, but sometimes it's totally out of your control. So from as a director, it totally helped my, me as an actor. As a writer, it also helps me because when I'm writing scripts, I also know what actors are looking for. And I also know, uh, you know, I do a lot of voiceovers as well and voiceover scripts too. And I, I know what's challenging to an actor or what's, what kind of scripts they liked. So being on many different sides of that same enter entertainment coin has really helped, you know, bolster me in the other areas. Because you are the voice of Bruce Banner, correct? I am the voice. I am the voice of Bruce Banner across Marvel's universe, animated universe, yes. 
<laughs> Very cool. So we also have a question coming in from uh, Mr. Kiko's class. Hey, so if we could have Mr. Nice, Kiko. Nice in. plug, by the way. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead, bud. Okay. Um, have you ever thought about maybe changing one of the costumes from, for one of the comic book characters you've written? Maybe. Yeah, in fact, um, you know, sometimes the rule is when you work for Marvel or DC, sometimes they're like, look, do whatever you want, but you just got to put it back the way you found it. So in other words, they don't want you to be like, oh, I have a great idea. I just killed Spider-Man. Wasn't that cool? It's going to get a lot of sales. And you're like, well, that's not going to work. But, um, you know, a good example of that would be my Superior Carnage script because and look some people didn't like it because uh, there's a cletus uh there's a guy who was always attached to carnage uh named cletus and people some people loved him i gave him a break and i attached carnage to somebody else some people loved that i did that some people hated that i did that but i wanted to do what you said i thought what can i do that hasn't been done before and what can i bring to this that would interest me. And so part of that was giving Carnage a whole new look and a whole new person. Um, so you take, you take chances, you know? I always joke, I was saying earlier uh, with Miss Dunn that I did the Kiss and Scooby-Doo movie. And what was funny was uh, I work with a lot of IP, a lot of products that people know from their childhood. And you know, you're always ruining someone's childhood. But for whatever reason, that Scooby-Doo and Kiss just hit the bullseye. I don't know if the, if the people were looking so low or whatever, but man, everybody loves that movie. And I think it's because there are so many fans of Kiss that were desperate to have their kids also like Kiss. And then this was a natural crossover. They can introduce them to them through Scooby-Doo. So, so yes, the answer again to your question, I always try and put my own spin on it if I can. You did develop a lot of new KISS fans from what we've heard That's from that. That's So, so um, you do work with a ton of really big franchises. And when you're doing all this writing, is there anyone else that you have to consult? Is there a process for making sure we stay true to storylines and things like that? Absolutely. Um, I guess the most obvious or the, uh, the most important was like Star Wars. Star Wars has a dedicated group called the Story Group. And they are about six to eight people, sometimes they rotate, who are the keepers of all things Star Wars. They know what's happening in the movies and the TV shows and the comics and the novels and, and whatever. So you're on a need to know basis when you're working with them. And I will tell you a funny story, which is funny in hindsight, but at the time I was like, what? So um, I told them I wanted to write a Star Wars novel. They came to me and said yes, and I pitched them this idea. So it took them about a year to greenlight, greenlight this idea. And they came to me and said, all right, it's greenlit. I was like, yes. And they said, we need it in three months. And I said, oh, maybe you misunderstood. I mean like a 90,000 word novel. They were like, yeah, so do we. And I was like, that, that's impossible. And of course, that dawned on me, that's exactly what Luke says to Yoda during training. And I was like, oh, I walked right into that. So I kill myself to, to get a draft, first draft of them within four months, let's say. And this is before the last movie came out. This is a year before uh, Rise of Skywalker came out, episode nine. And I hand it in, and then right before Christmas, two years ago, they call me and they say, well, we have a problem. And I said, what? They said, somehow, without you knowing, you wrote a big section of episode nine, which was the movie that was coming out. And I was like, what? I was like, you, well, you got me on the wrong gig then. I need to be writing that movie. And we laughed, and they were like, yeah, anyway, you gotta change yours. And I was like, oh, so I had to go back and change some things. But, um, but yeah, that was the story. And so anyway, they are the ones who know what's going on. Uh, usually yeah. you have an editor or a story person or something that usually with giant IPs can say to you, oh, you're going a little, you can't really go there. That's fair. And with a franchise that large, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting to hear you're on that need to know basis, but you're already ahead of them. You're exactly. In there. <laughs> and you know, not, and that's a great thing that Lucasfilm has because not every group has a story group. A lot of times you'll do things and at the last hour of a comic book, they'll call them and the editor will be like, oh, oh, we got to change this because they're not allowed to do that. It's like, oh, if I had time. So a lot. And that's the other thing I will say real quickly. It's easy to sit back and look at, and this is how we all become inspired by things. You see things that you think, I could do that better, or I can, you know, I wanna take a stab at that. But it's not always, can you do that? 
It's always, can you do that under their parameters? So can you do that in three months? Can you do that with a deadline that the comic book needs to be done tomorrow? So the, you, know, you, you learn to appreciate all that goes into creating this art. Okay. So we are getting close to the end of our time, but we do want to say thank you. I know you only see four classes on the screen today. So these are our live classes. And then tomorrow, every single one of our students at Merrick Avenue is going to be watching this uh, recording, which is pretty cool. So we know we have a lot of students who are still excited. We have a few more comics and books to um, raffle off. Um, but we want to say thank you very much for giving us the time today and sharing your passion with us. I'm glad we were able to connect with you from New York to California today. Um, a very special thank you, of course, to you and to our PTA for setting this up for us. Um, but are there any final words you want to leave us with, Kevin? Well, it just that it was my pleasure to speak with you today. And like I said, Merrick holds a special place in my heart. And I always come back. And if I can inspire someone from Merrick to go out and you know follow their dreams, then I'm all for it. So keep doing what, you, what interests you and make the world a better place. Thank you very much. Everyone want to give Kevin a wave? <laughs> Thank you very much for your time today. Of course. Thank you. All right.